like to invite Dr. B.J. Prashant and Michelle Chaudhary to the podium, please. <laughs> Professor Dr. E.S. Krishnamurti is an internationally recognized as a leader in the brain-mind interface, the field of neuropsychiatry, founder director of the Neuropsychiatry Group, a professional excellence grouping providing multidisciplinary clinical services. He's also founder member, CEO and chief consultant of Tejas Healthcare Solutions Private Limited, a reputed medical wellness provider. Dr. Krishmurti is convener of the healthcare panel, CII, and also serves as honorary secretary of prestigious not-for-profit organization, the Voluntary Health Services Multi-Speciality Hospital and Research Institute, a 500-bed hospital and healthcare system in Chennai with 14 primary health centers. I've been to theaters and I can tell you it's one of the most innovative and unique kind of offerings of its kind. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Dr. DJ Prashantam, um, also my teacher. Dr. Prashantam is a world-renowned psychologist, professor with 40 years of professional experience having versatile competencies in areas like corporate coaching, counseling, clinical and cross-cultural psychology, as well as in psychoneuroimmunology. He is chairman of the Institutional Review Board of CMC Hospital for Research Ethics and an honorary board member and a trainer of CFI. For those of us who've attended the sessions at CFI, He's a very, very important person who, who we've all learned so much from. He is the director of the Institute for Human Relations, Counseling and Psychotherapy Law, as well as clinical faculty of Global Health at the University of Washington. Our subject that we are going to hear from them about is sorry, I beg your pardon. Michelle Chowdhury is an executive coach and management consultant with business and leadership experience, spanning 20 years in areas of general management, quality, operations, program management, and training. Michelle believes that self-awareness and self-management is the key to being an effective leader and coach, and her explorations into NLP, TA, and now neuroscience have proved invaluable on her journey. Michelle's passion and expertise lie in coaching for leader, leadership and excellence. Our subject, understanding the brain to coach the mind, a brief tour of essential neuroscience over team. Thanks a lot, Anita. Um, doctor, it's a pleasure to be here. When I was first asked to co anchor the session on uh, understanding the brain to coach the mind, my first thought was is there really a difference? Because isn't the mind just a virtual manifestation of the physical brain? But then, of course, very soon I had thought that it can't possibly be so because. Surely the mind is who I am, which means I have to be a lot more than just that physical brain. And surely I should have control over my brain so that I can then control my reality. So I had a lot of these questions going around and when I got down to try to make sense of it, I found that I'm not the only one with these kind of questions. There are a lot of conflicting theories out there about which comes first, the chicken or the egg, the brain or the, the mind. So it will be really helpful today to have uh, some insights from you, you know about the essence of neuroscience, help us understand what the brain is vis-a-vis -vis the mind and what the interface between the two is. And perhaps if there is you know, some way that you can help us understand why this is important for us as coaches, that would be even better. Um, great pleasure to be here and I'd like to thank Panesh and everyone else here for inviting me. Um, to answer your question, um, the brain is obviously a, a complex of billions of cells which talk to each other through networks. And the networks are powered, as you might think about, but with chemicals and hormones. So it's really a very complex organ. Billions of neurons talk to each other. 
So while I'm talking, you're listening, it's processed, and other center is able to understand it, another center is able to kind of rehearse that information, and another center might help you kind of store it as a memory. And you might retain that memory for some time, you may not retain it for, uh, you may retain it for a very long time. That depends on a number of other factors. But essentially, therefore, it's a complex of nerves, which are like wires, and chemicals, which are the connections between the nerves. And that's really what comprises the brain. And if you think about the mind, it really is just like the software in your brain. So your mind is like your Windows operating system. And sometimes it can hang, sometimes it can have a virus, <laughs> sometimes it may not function so well. But essentially, what underpins it is the brain. And of course, the brain does much more than just the mind. The brain has work to do in terms of making you walk, talk, uh, eat, drink, uh, you know, perform your bodily functions. All of that is done by the brain. Uh, but one very important component of that is the brain. If I could probably just expand on things like memory, how many of you have been to Madras on a train? Quite a few hands up. When you reach this station called Basin Bridge, just outside the drums, you get this wonderful order, <laughs> which is anything but wonderful. And yet it makes you feel happy. Now, smell memory is the oldest form of human memory. In fact, it's the oldest form of mammal memory. The one thing you share with the rat is smell. Okay, so you smell and you remember. And that's why when you read Madras, that order tells you who I am Madras. <laughs> now the order stimulates the memory, oh this is Madras. This smell is very typical, it's, it's metallic, it's got a very interesting uh, flavor. <laughs> and yet, it then provokes an emotion, I've got hope, or oh, well I've reached where I wanted to reach, and you're happy. You should be recoiling with that smell, but you're not. And I think that's the very interesting connection between how memory and emotion are linked. There is this little organ. If you draw a line straight through here between your ears, there's a little organ called a hippocampus, which is the size of a small finger joint. And that is the storehouse of all your memories. And that's connected very closely with another organ, which lies beside it, which is made up of multiple small areas. And that's called the amygdala which is the storehouse of all your emotions. So the link between memory and emotion is very, very close, which is why sometimes emotion-laden memory is what lasts, right? Uh, you don't, if, if there's great emotion with a memory, then you're very unlikely to forget that. And there are tests, for example, that are frequently done, which I'm sure Dr. Prashantam can tell you about. For example, if I asked you, what were you doing when Indira Gandhi died? How many people can say, I remember what I was doing when Indra Gandhi died? Quite a few hands going up. Most Americans can remember what they were doing when John F. Kennedy died, provided they were old enough to remember. Yeah. So the point is there's a profound moment. There is an emotion. And you remember, I was walking out of college, I remember that, when Indra Gandhi died. And I heard the news that she had. So it made an impact. And there's the link between the emotion and the memory. And it's therefore important to remember that if you want somebody to remember something, try and link it with a bit of emotion. Then they are much more likely to remember it than if it is emotionless and it is uncovered. Uh, and of course we are taught to communicate without emotion, not with emotion. But I think we have to be taught to provoke emotion while we communicate. This is really important. Yeah, I believe the French philosopher uh, Picard had this, you made this famous statement, I think therefore I am, and it's now referred to as the Descartes error because it completely leaves out the whole concept of emotion which is now gaining so much ground. Uh, Doctor, you spoke about order, you spoke about, I think, um, because it's connected to emotion, it means something and you remember it. Does the same go for your visual, for your, you know, for the other senses, the visuals? Absolutely. Really? Every one of your senses uh, is kind of processed by your brain. The information, you know, you, you, your brain decodes that information, what is happening right now. And then you are able to uh, either imbibe it as memory 
or respond to it appropriately. So when you read a book, for example, I mean, you can stand in front of a painting and cry. You can listen to music and you can be moved to tears. So that is the link between your senses and your memory and emotion. Because it triggers a certain a feeling within you, which is probably linked to something that happened a long time ago. I remember I was having a cycling race with this girl in my class. And there was this horrible Tamil song playing that we were both cycling. And she fell down. And then she pretended for the next two days to have seizures, unfortunately. And uh, that was my first encounter with what we call pseudo seizures. And interestingly, even now when somebody plays that song, I feel a lot of anxiety. I feel very sad. Mm -hmm. I feel very upset. Because that's how I felt at that point in time that I made somebody have something bad, which I never really intended to. And I guess that that again, so all your senses are kind of linked up with memory and it's rather dangerous, right? Because then, especially for negative memories, you, you get connected so closely to them, you get attached to them. Uh, how yes, does one move on? Memories can be both negative and positive, and I think it's very important to decide which ones to keep and which ones to, uh, to try and expunge. And we have uh, a choice then? And not get to. Uh, well, I don't think, I mean, there are always things that make us feel sad, and uh, there are always things that provoke negative emotions. But I think as uh, Paulo Coelho says, this fits with your emotional rubbish, because it, it is unhealthy. Uh, a negative memory or a negative emotion seldom proves anything positive in you, except to warn you perhaps not to do something. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Murthy, you have given in such simple language some of the intricacies of this uh, amazing brain, about which in the recent years, last 30, 40 years, more has been understood than before, heard by World War One, World War Two uh, situations where many were injured, and the doctors <coughs> then studied and came to know these things. And uh, I, I was remembering uh, a situation where I was teaching a class on What is hippocampus? <coughs> One student raised his hand and said, What is it? Please go ahead. He said, Hippocampus is the fattest fellow in our campus. <laughs> <laughs> this morning we had one of the sessions. Anita started in Rasho and Pradeep Tho and Ganesh, and subsequently the And one of the things we could see was each one of their style was different. <clears throat> the way they spoke, the way they composed their thoughts, the way they expressed. And one of the challenges we face in executive coaching, counseling, and many people related helping activities is <coughs> on the one hand, the helper A, helper B is different from each other. And the healthy A, healthy B is also different from each other. The challenge seems to be not only self-understanding, but also understanding how the other person is wired differently. And therefore, not to um, have the same stereotypical approach to them, leading to individual differences, how people are differently wired. Would you kindly comment on that? Sure. Uh, let me bring you down to earth by talking about my two dogs. Uh, I have a German Shepherd, his name is Carlo. And I have a Basset Hound, his name is Coco. Now, Carlo and Coco's personalities are best expressed in their morning walk. The German Shepherd can walk 4-5 kilometers, no leash. He will never go more than 10 feet away from me. And for him, the walk is purposeful which means he'll perform his ablutions and then we are off and we do not stop at all unless I stop. With Coco, the Basset Hound, and I don't know how many of you uh, recognize the Basset Hound, the hush puppy dog with long ears, he looks absolutely cute, but he's the most horrible fellow in the world. <laughs> when you take him for a walk, he has to explore everything and everybody. 
every sight, every sound, every smell, every human being, every other animal, every plant, every tree. So the walk is never a walk. The walk is an exploration. And initially I used to get a bit angry with Coco because Coco couldn't do the walk the way Carlo did. And Carlo gets angry with Coco as well because he can't understand why he can't get on with this walk. <laughs> so there were two people getting angry with Coco all the time. I then understood that Coco was just a lot more right brain. He was a creative, exploratory personality who would like to do many things. He wanted to find out about everything around him. He wasn't purposeful, which is very much more left brain. The left brain person is very much more ideological, philosophically inclined, duty bound, follows a routine, follows a rhythm. Now if you imagine Carlo and Coco being man married to each other, <laughs> disaster. As Dr. Nagaswamy will soon tell you later in the day. And that is the whole point. That when you come to a workplace situation or you come to any relationship situation, <coughs> fundamentally people are wired differently. And most of the time, we are spending our time trying to make that person fit a certain space, fit a certain role. So you are trying to put a square cube into a round hole. And when you fail, you get upset. Because you are failing to put that square cube in the round hole. But that square cube was never meant to be in the round hole in the first place. He's just wired very, very differently. And I think it's that fundamental understanding about personalities and human beings, which is very important in terms of trying to ascribe role and responsibility, managing our expectations of people, and uh, dealing with them. And this is perhaps also one major reason why people end up in situations of conflict. Because they just can't accept that the other person is different, the other person is going to do things differently. And which is what they say, that if you have a very creative person in your workplace, he is sometimes the most difficult person to manage as well. Because with that creative temperament comes a lot of emotion. With the right brain comes a lot of emotional swings. With the right brain comes that ability to be enormously uh, uh, productive, and at the same time go into periods when you are not at all productive. Right? And it's like, uh, you know, Kamli and Dravid. You know, we all like Dravid because he'll come and he'll produce something. And we'll get that 50 at least when he's there. And then you get this other guy who'll come and sometimes you have this wonderful flash of brilliance. And the other time he's kind of disappeared. When you most need him, he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And we find that difficult. And I think these things are wired by personality and temperament. Follow up, Doctor. May I also ask if uh, men and women are wired differently? Very I I think that I am not the expert in men and women. So I will leave it to the real expert. But uh, to be quite honest, I think we do see. I mean, if you look at it from a science perspective, I think men and women uh, both can be left brain and right brain. Men and women can both be purposeful and creative. So I don't think it is totally gender based. But there is some interesting evidence. For example, when you look at, say, depression, women in middle age, for example, seem to be slightly more prone to it. And studies of brain organs show us that the amygdala is larger on the right side in women who get depressed. Now, that's an interesting finding in the sense that it's chicken or egg. You don't know whether it's the large amygdala that's making them depressed or you don't know whether it's being depressed that's making the amygdala larger. But what we do understand is that the brain is a remarkably plastic organ. It can change in uh, you know, function, it can change in shape as you go along. Uh, there's a very interesting study called the London Cab Driver Study. The London Cab Driver who drives the black cab he has to learn the London map in his head. And this is therefore, you know, reams and reams of maps which have to be read, understood and stored. So a lot of visual memory also that goes into this. And if you tell a London cab driver, it's, it's a two year period of training called the knowledge. If you tell him that I want to go to Smith Street, W6, 
he should be able to tell you orally that I go this way, this way, this way, this is a one way, that's this, that's that, and that's how I get there. I park you. So it's a little bit like a GPS. He ought to know this in his head, and of course, this came from the days before the GPS. Now, when they measured the hippocampus of the London cab driver before he got into the knowledge training, and when they measured it repeatedly during the training, and at the end of the training, two years later when they measured it, the organ had actually grown in size to about a one and a half times what it was when they started. And this is one of the earliest uh, you know, studies done a few years ago to tell us how plastic the brain is as an organ. And I'm saying this also to say, therefore, the brain has got capacity to change. And the brain has got the ability to adapt. Uh, what prevents often change in adaptation is the mind. Uh, because your mindset tells you that I cannot change or adapt. Whereas the brain actually has got the ability to learn, change, adapt, and go forward. That uh, sounds very exciting because that means behavior can modify brain. It's like brain influences behavior. And does that also mean that then our ability to learn almost has no limit? That lifelong learning is a possibility uh, that can be afforded by neuroscience. Absolutely. There is really no limit to the ability of a human to learn to uh, uh, sort of get new information and retain new information, to, to learn new tasks, you know, learn new skills. In fact, one of the things that's now being taught to people uh, is that as you retire, start learning a new skill. Take up a serious hobby, because otherwise your brain's at risk of continuing. And some of this comes from a very interesting study called the Nun Study. The Nun Study was done in a cloister where people uh, you know, uh, these young women had gone in and decided to take a vow of silence and live in this ubiquitous environment for the rest of their lives. Okay. At the time that they went into the cloister, they wrote a biography. And what the people who did the nun study did was they examined those women for their memory and for their emotions. But they also went back and looked at the biography. And what the biography showed was that if you had a high level of literary ability, if you had a high level of uh, you know, number of words, the way you expressed yourself, the content of what you wrote as an essay was very rich, then you're much less likely to become demented or lose your memory as you get older. And why this was important? Because most of us have multiple inputs, millions of inputs to our lives. And therefore, our memory and our emotions are enriched as we go along without any effort. Whereas these people had taken a vow of silence and gone into a ubiquitous uh, environment. So there are two things. One is that, uh, you know, if you have a great reserve, you know a lot, you read a lot, you're very aware of your environment, you're learning new things, then it takes much longer for you to fall, just like your bank account. Right? If you have a great bank account, so if you have a great intellectual bank account, then you won't lose your memory easily or you won't lose your functionality easily as you get older. But also that the brain is remarkably plastic, which means you can keep learning right through your life. This is so much a profound implications for executive coaching because we are dealing with persons who are growing and some of them just wonder, you know, at this age, can I learn something, do something? But what you are saying is so encouraging, Doctor, that our uh, neurological system is geared to handle this situation and very relevant for us. Which makes me wonder how the brain seems to have the proclivity to expand, to, you know, to be elastic, plastic, as you mentioned. So why do we find change so hard? We're always struggling when it comes to learning new things or changing some behavior that we have and try to run in the opposite direction when that happens. I mean, if you think about it, if someone gives you a new phone uh, and you don't really need it, it's just thrust upon you. Your employer says, I'm changing everybody's phone now. Here's your new phone. It's not something that you readily accept. Because you feel a bit technologically challenged with that new instrument. You have to learn how it works. You'll have to learn how to get stores data. You'll have to find out how you're going to transfer what data you have in your other instrument to this one. And so most people, the first reaction 
is to reject change. Is to say, well, I don't want this. Thank you so much. I'm quite all right where I am. Because we're hardwired in that way? Because we've got used to doing what we were doing in a certain way, and we think that we may not be able to learn the new class. So it's not that we don't have the ability. Our mindset prevents us from wanting to learn the new class. But there's another thing associated with this, because I think culturally, especially this society, Eastern societies, we also all have an inherent fear of failure. That's been drilled so hard into us through our education system, through our families, that you can't afford to fail. Which means that you, even when you do something like this, which has got a minimal amount of risk involved, deep within you, you don't want to fail. And it's that not wanting to fail, to fail which kind of also makes you very wary of taking up something new, as simple as a spell. There are other issues. I mean, if you think about it, for example, I meet a number of people who have issues with authority figures. Okay. And this has probably got to do with early life experiences. And a bell goes off in your mind the moment you meet somebody who appears to be a bit of an authority figure. Even if they are not really in a position to be an authority figure, if they appear to be an authority figure, your intense, inherent response is negative. I don't like this guy. <coughs> right? I want to reject him. Because he reminds me in my brain of someone else I had to deal with, which an experience which I did not like at all. So these are latent memories and latent emotions that get evoked and provoked in different situations. So the, the, the key perhaps is being able to recognize that. The key perhaps is being able to say, it's not that this guy is a bad guy or he's any different from anybody else I have to deal with. This is what he's meeting him is doing this to me. And therefore, I will have to deal with this differently. So that that is a question of self-awareness and you know, being able to recognize what's happening. I was just curious about what is actually happening in the brain at, these, at this point. Uh, we talked about the memory center. We talked about the emotion center. And what really perhaps happens is that when you trigger an emotion-related memory, it in some latent way is replaying itself in its mind your mind. And you may not even be aware of it. And I think that that is the whole point. That a lot of what we process is stuff that we are not aware of. A lot of what we process is very, very important. In neurology we call it subcortical. And in psychiatry we say in your subconscious. Uh, in, in all these settings this is not something that comes to your awareness. You are not thinking about it. But that person, that situation provokes a certain response within you. And your inherent response is one of suspicion, one of fear, one of anxiety, one of negativism. And your inherent feeling, therefore, is that I should reject this, not accept it. And I think that that is perhaps what is happening in that situation. So as coaches, this is something we're going to be facing all the time. Because we are helping our coaches help themselves, so to speak. You know, we're faced with such uh, reactions. How do you recommend we work? I suppose one thing to think about when it comes to change, I want you to all think about an older person in your house who is going to catch a plane with you this evening and how they behave. Right? If you say the flight is at 7 pm and we will leave home at 4 pm in order to be in the airport by 5.30, they are happy with you. But if at 4 pm you say to them, sorry, we're going to leave at half past 4 all hell breaks loose. Because then they keep asking you the same question over and over again. When are we going to go? We'll be late. We'll miss the flight. Now, why do older people do that? And a lot of younger people don't do that. It's not just temperament. Most older people do that. Most younger people don't. And the reason is something called cognitive flexibility. Right? That's one of the things that you lose as you get older. You're unable to parallel process. You're unable to what we call in, in neuropsychology, shift set. It's like you're going on one road, you need to switch to another road. And as you get older, it becomes harder to switch to another road. It's not just your mind that gets fixed as you get older. It's also your brain that gets fixed. And your brain finds it very hard to switch. Now this is one reason why uh, leadership as one becomes older becomes more challenging as well. 
because there are other people out there who are very ready to shift set and you are not able to keep pace with them. So when it comes to change, one has to understand perhaps that uh, you know, you are dealing with somebody who is having difficulty in cognitive flexibility. They are not able to see uh, you know, why it is important or how they can change. There is also a personal attitude. Uh, a lot of people have to see the glass as half empty. When in reality it is half empty. And that is an attitude. I mean, I got to Jet Airways this morning and the air hostess very pleasantly said, Good morning, sir, as I walked. And I felt cheered up by her. And the chap behind me said to her, What's so good about this morning? <laughs> While we're working them with them, we will assume that you know, it's going to take them a lot longer, be more patient. Is there some way, uh, as explained by the brain, by which we can ensure lasting change? Um, one is, I suppose, bringing about change. Yeah. I think most people need examples they can relate to. And that's one of the very interesting things. Right. I mean, if you look at medical marketing, for example, most medical marketing requires a human in the store. Right? And if you think about it, you've got serious public health problems. Tuberculosis is a serious public health problem. A heart transplant is not a serious public health problem. The number of people who have tuberculosis in their life far outnumbers the number of people who have a heart transplant by billions. But if you took these two stories, the story of tuberculosis and the story of heart transplant to a newspaper, the heart transplant will take three quarters of the page and the tuberculosis will get a small column on the right. And the reason is because that is a human interest story. There is one person there who benefited from his having his heart transplanted. So I think change has to be to some extent demonstrated. Change has to some extent ring a bell within you. You have to empathize that change. You have to understand that it's a positive uh, elements to it. And change also perhaps very much requires for me to, to have a human example how it benefited somebody else. And you can look at the stock market. You know, somebody puts money into something and it starts going up and all of us go and put money in. Right? So the guy who is really wise is the guy who put money into it right at the beginning. The guys who are not very wise are the ones who are catching the tail end. But the vast majority of us are looking for examples and we follow those examples. And I think managing change requires giving people examples they can relate to, examples they can work with, Examples that they can make their own. Uh, uh, this is something that I can do as well. That's, that's definitely very helpful. It seems to me that you are able to even anticipate what questions are coming in terms of the way you have answered. And there are some answers to these questions you can answer as a way as What strategies do you recommend coaches can use to help people change, to accept, welcome and implement change? You've been uh, speaking, I, I trust I have tried to answer that. There's a further question, happy to be that all right. No, that's fine, I did it before he mentioned it. No, that's why I said the doctor has anticipated. And uh, now there is another question we will straight away take before we uh, come to close. Uh, there are one or two more questions I have for you, Doctor. But here, there, there's, there's some more. <laughs> How do you explain procrastination? Is it lack of memory, laziness or disinterest, lack of commitment? Have any sense of I think, you know, when you do multiple choice questions, <laughs> there's something called all of the above or none of the above. <laughs> So, I think procrastination is all of the above. Um, I'm not aware of uh, studies on procrastination. I think a lot of studies are done about decision making and what makes people take decisions, what processes do they follow when they take decisions. 
And there are two kinds of processes broadly that most of us use. One is the logical process and the other is the emotive process. And most often we have to use a combination of both in, in, good, in, in the important situations. But for example, uh, you know, when my wife buys a car, it's so different from when I buy the car. When I buy the car, I'm saying fuel economy, bang for buck, etc., etc., etc. I tell her the same stories and say, poof, the upholstery is poor, the interiors are bad. And then she chooses the car based on the upholstery and the interiors. The same purchase. Now, the point, therefore, is that is very emotive decision making. She is making a decision based on an emotional connect with what she is purchasing even though that happens to be not a, a small value product. Whereas, important decisions are usually best made logically. And very often we make the mistake of making them emotional. To give you an example, <laughs> someone annoys you to the point where you feel you have to fire them. You don't necessarily think about the implications of firing that individual. Either to him or to yourself or to the company. You just go ahead and do it. And then you realize, of course, that there are implications. And therefore, that was an emotional decision that went wrong. Uh, I think women are more likely to use emotion during their decision-making process, which actually is perhaps a great strength because it makes you a more empathetic leader. It makes you more likely to connect with the person for whom you're making a decision and or with whom you're making the decision. Uh, and this is what is often said as well, that uh, is, you know, it ascribes a certain style of leadership. Whereas, uh, you know, so in, in, once again in, in neuroscience we talk about intellectual quotient and of course what's become more popular today, emotional quotient. And I think again...
has a role to play in, in the fundamental ego process. What, what would be some red flags for us as coaches to keep in mind, uh, particularly to you know who might be suitable to refer to specialists like yourself, so that we may be able to assist them uh, much more effectively. Okay. Um, I think the first thing is if you see someone who clearly is in an acute crisis and they are not coping very well at all uh, and this is typically someone who is dissolving into tears or is you know, going into a rage, extremely upset, unable to manage their emotions, it's quite possible that that person needs slightly more professional help than you will be able to give in the setting in which you are working. So I think that's the first red flag that I would always keep in mind. The second red flag I would keep in mind is the pattern. It's not the first time it's happening, it keeps happening over and over again. Then I think there clearly is there are issues that go beyond that particular setting. The third, and I think this is very, you know, largely we think about problems of the mind as neurotic and psychotic. And the difference is the reality orientation. How much in reality is this person rooted in? And if there is a complete lack of reality orientation in what the person is saying or sharing, or even if it appears to be realistic, it appears to be extremely far-fetched, then it is a very wise thing to take professional advice or help for that particular individual. The other little things that we talk about in psychotherapy, and I'm sure that Dr. Vijay Lakshmi will take you through some of these things. Uh, for example, if someone brings forward their appointments, turns up too early, wants to extend the duration of the contact, is expecting to contact you in ways and means that are not appropriate, like for example, call you at the phone in hours that are completely inappropriate, have unscheduled discussions. All these are indications that the attachment is going far beyond what it should go in that particular setting. And therefore one needs to be aware that that is happening. Conversely, if we are all human and there are times when we can get feelings uh, or empathize a little too much with the person we are working with. And it's very important to recognize that that is happening. If there is uh, far greater empathy than there should be or there are feelings that are not explained by the professional relationship. But then of course that's a very grey area. I remember a psychotherapy teacher of mine telling me, oh, when my patient cries, I cry and I feel that level of empathy. And to this state, I've never understood that because I never cry with any of my patients. I've never really understood why he could feel that way and I don't. But then obviously the levels of empathy vary for any Thank you, Doctor. Anita has said that time is up, so allow me to conclude with two three sentences. And that is, um, we, we have had some excellent insights that can be applied to <coughs> doctor. And as doctor said, you know, people think that there are these uh, it simplistically neurotic and psychotic. And it is said as many of you might have heard, and doctor will know very well. Facetious. Neurotics are those who build castles in the air. Psychotics are those who live in them. And psychiatrists and counselors are those who collect rent from both of them. <laughs> I can see we are not willing to let them go, but we have to, I'm afraid. And there's Mr. Ramraj to hand over mementos. Thank you, Dr. Vishnuvi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. <laughs>